uh, led by Eric Gregory, who's now a professor of religious studies at uh, Princeton University, not seminary. And um, he also brought me into the Chaim Society, which is a Jewish uh, group that uh, you know, shares experiences uh, with, with non-Jewish folks. Um, and Corey Booker was the head of this at Oxford. He was also at law school this year ahead of us. Um, and uh, so, so you know, we, we were always sort of cross-fertilizing intellectually, uh, not, not just on sort of policy and law questions, but on these deeper fundamental religious questions. So let me get a little of the book and not just sort of the background. Um, you know, the Passover, why should, we, why should we read a book that's principally on the Passover and really to a to significant part of it is an explication of this book, the, the, the Haggadah, which is sort of the, the guidebook for the Passover. The book, as Mark is very express about in the opening, is itself kind of a guidebook. It's a guidebook to the Haggadah. There, there are 60 chapters in here, so it breaks down easily. This isn't a book to just sort of read, you know, cover to cover. It's not, it's not a fiction type of book. Um, but you can pick out any one of these. And the chapters usually are quite short. Some of the early chapters are longer. And there's sort of like a lesson and it'll pull apart a piece of this book from the Passover Seder. And then Mark will sort of explicate it. And what I think makes it engaging for uh, a, a modern reader is the way Mark pulls together uh, different uh, influences in, in doing this. So um, in addition to Jewish texts and, and sort of the Jewish tradition from various rabbis through history who've talked about these issues, he brings in current events, he brings in uh, popular culture, he brings in uh, studies in social science, brings in studies in uh, psychology. Uh, and, and so, so it's, it's, a, it's a very erudite book and an accessible book. Um, and, and uh, you know, the Passover, of course, is, is something, you know, as I said, I think a lot of Christians are um, ignorant about parts of our Old Testament. I don't, don't spend as much time on it as perhaps we should. Uh, but the Passover is one we all are basically familiar with. I mean, Exodus 12 and 13 is where the Seder is, is derived from. The basic foundation of Exodus book is one most of us know well. Um, even people who aren't Christians in America know it well because they've seen Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments or what have you. I mean, these are classic Americana. As I'll talk about, Mark, Mark sort of ties together America and the American project very much with Judaism and the Passover. So it's a central theme up front in his book. Um, we also, of course, as I said, know it through our Easter story. It's, it's embedded in, 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 in our Sacrament of Holy Communion, etc. So so this book really, I mean, the, the beginning part is sort of the framing of the book. And Mark uh, goes through in the framing, you know, the sections of the book. The first is sort of the background, what decided to implement that vision. And, and, and I think, you know, you, you have to read the first part first. I think it really frames everything else for you. The second section of the book is, is probably the least germane to, to most of us as Christians. I mean, I find it interesting. I think it's worthwhile, uh, but it's basically how to prepare a Passover Seder. So I, I think it might be particularly interesting for folks who haven't participated in one because it gives you an idea sort of how a Seder works. Um, you know, but, but it, it is much more sort of, you know, this is how you want to set up your Passover Seder. And Mark and his wife put enormous thought into this. They, they have guest lists of, you know, there are always people from Israel in the Seder. There are always you know, very observant Jews of different Jewish backgrounds. Would have been doing this once a year, um, uh, not with the, the new American Haggadah, but with with their version of the Seder at the time, you know, derived from the time of Moses and something you know that existed from one year uh, after the Exodus uh, in perpetuity. So um, the, the third part of the book, the volume of the book after those sort of Seder tips, is I think these are sort of the ones that you can just sort of flip open. You don't even have to read them if, if one of the chapters is interesting to you. Uh, read it because they're very quick. And they explicate a part of the Haggadah. 
And I think they're, you know, it, 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 it's sort of like reading the Psalms or the Proverbs or something like this. Now you can just pull something of value out. If you wanted to do a daily devotional in the morning, oh, here's a three page chapter on something that sounds really interesting. So um, uh, first harmless magic. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can read about it in two pages and get something interesting. Um, and um, some of them have, have great sort of uh, little titles. Um, to the, to the chapters, you know, this one is very interesting to me. We can come back to it. Why political arguments are usually a waste of time or worse. Uh, uh, uh. Um, and uh, where's the one about? Oh yeah, <laughs> this is a good one. Singing the sable of singing women are so sexually satisfied. <laughs> and so you have these 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 themes. And but what's interesting is, I mean, he he pulls through in each of these sort of chapters. You know, something from the Haggadah, something from the scriptures, something from rabbinic wisdom that's been passed through the Talmud and other religious rabbinic writings over the years, and then also something that's relatable to us in our modern era, and something that is, um, you know, d derived from some sort of social science or scientific research. So, so you can go to the end notes and find these great sort of follow-ons to it, and I, I find it very, very interesting. So just, just some themes that he pulls out, you know, from the early part of the book, you know, the framing that I, I found particularly interesting. Um, and we went through some of these, those of you who were there for our uh, uh, book talk that I did virtually in the spring when the book first came out. Uh, but I'll go through them again and sort of my spin on it. I was basically an interlocutor in that. And one thing that that he wrote about, which I found fascinating, is that from Mark's perspective, and, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a scriptural, a biblical perspective, Mark is probably more so than some Jewish people, more of a textualist, uh, going back to the scripture. Um, this probably comports with the way he reads legal texts as well. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of discussions on those subjects as well. But, but you know, he'll say Passover is time around Jewish people. I mean, and, and that may not be everyone in the room, but, but uh, I always thought Rosh Hashanah was the Jewish New Year. Certainly, Living up in the north, we got off for the high holy days, uh, you know, so, so my kids were off of school, not only for Christmas, um, and sometimes it would be Good Friday, we'd get off, uh, but, but, but we would get off for the high holy days, so Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the high holy days, which is basically a, a you know, two-week span in September or October. And when I was on the board uh, of elders of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York, we always had a sort of shared experience with Central Synagogue, the Reform Synagogue about two blocks away in New York. And during Christmas and Easter, uh, the leaders of that synagogue would be our ushers. They would help us run our services so that our board members could worship with their families and that sort of spring work uh, during our highest holidays. And we did the same for them during the high holy days. So I was able to go experience and be sort of an usher and hand out programs, et cetera, at the central synagogue during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I always thought, you know, you know, this is, this is the new year, Rosh Hashanah. Well, it is a new, a new year, but, but, but this will say, no, that the real new year is, is Passover. Um, and this is sort of parallel New Year, and, and Mark doesn't view these as, as an inherently or intellectually contradictory, as he says, we have a lot of New Year's, right? <laughs> we You are muted. Um, and so he would say that, but he would also say, you know, July 4th is a New Year's Day. It's our national 
birthday, right? And, and we celebrate our wedding anniversaries. Those are New Year's days for us. We celebrate our birthdays, our biological birthdays. Those are New Year's days. So, so we, we regularly have multiple sort of New Year's um, in, our, in our calendar. And, and he views you know, the Passover as, as the newest Jewish New Year. Um, the, another interesting thing that he fo focuses on, he talks about Moses's world. And uh, so he talks about uh, you know, the young and on education and how this was a peculiar, I mean, listen, I, I don't know how much this is uniquely or idiosyncratically a Jewish tradition. I mean, I think, I think people around the world focus on young, but I do think that these sort of focus on educating the young uh, is something that is idiosyncratically a part of the Jewish tradition. And he talks about world literacy rates uh, and how they've grown and blown up uh in in recent years and and how that is really fulfilling some of the the vision of moses um and he talks about how you know jewish people uh, unsurprisingly have, have been at sort of the vanguard of that i mean if you look at nobel prizes like eleven thousand times their population percentage um you know there are many reasons why that may be but but he focuses a lot on this sort of educational tradition and and you know a part that i found particularly relevant was his explication on uh, the United States and American experience, which you know, I think most a lot of us in Newburn are sort of drawn to history and drawn to American history. You know, it's part of what we find attractive here in this community, uh, which is historical. And you know, his book chapter I think is called "The Greatest Seder of All: Passover and the American Experience." And um, what I particularly found you know interesting here was. Uh, you know, he really goes in depth into uh, the, the parallels between the slave experience and the out of slavery experiences uh, of the Jewish people in the Exodus and uh, that here in the United States. And, uh, you know, those of you who know me, my, my wife is, is black, you know, her great grandfather was a born a slave. So, I, you know, these are something that I think resonate with me and with our family. Uh, in, in, a, in a profound way, but I think it is it is a profound part of our American experience uh, too, obviously, and and the parallels are, are are deep. And it is something that any of you who've worshipped in in black churches will see. You know, the, the the Moses story is very central to a lot of black churches' faith, right? Uh, understandably, and and this became something in the in the nineteenth century, and this became a part of abolitionist thinking in the United States uh, in the 19th century where, you know, you know, how can you fo follow a faith where the central, um, uh, uh, you know, one of the central stories of the faith is this out of slavery experience. And then we here we have this slave system here uh, in the United States, you know, isn't there a remarkable tension between these two? And that sort of forward looking hope and out of slavery experience was an animating feature. And I think a lot of the 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 early uh, the, the Christianity that developed in the slave communities and thereafter, um, and so so I, I think it's a very powerful thing. And this is you know this is something it's not just Mark. I mean this is something straight from the Haggadah itself. So I got this this new American Haggadah, and you'll see this is uh, a part of the new American Haggadah uh, that they would read in a Passover Seder based on this version of it. And then the participants would say. You know, the Jewish people are not the only group to have been made slaves and oppressed. Our mm -hmm. duty to remember our own hardship should also include the recognition of the suffering of, of other nations, races, and ethnicities. One group to have suffered in America was the African slaves who worked the fields of Southern plantations. They remembered our suffering to inspire their own pursuit of freedom. We should not forget theirs. And then the leader says, go down Moses as an African-American spiritual that was sung throughout the South by slaves while they worked. It was also sung by abolitionists to signal escape or rebellion. Let us acknowledge our shared struggle by singing it now. And they sing that actual uh, spiritual in that version. If, if, you know, and most satyrs aren't going to use necessarily every page of, of every Haggadah, but, but, but in a satyr experience, that is sung regularly here in the United States. So I think it, it's something of, of interesting relevance to us. And it's not just the slave experience, though. I mean, he he brings through how um, how so much of Americana is influenced. He talks about Cecil B. DeMille both in the twenties and the fifties, and how central you know that is. I mean, when I was a kid, we watched it on TV. I mean, at Easter time, we always had we always had around Easter time, we always had the Ten Commandments on TV, um, and and so we watched it every year on network TV. 
Um, and but he also talks about other facets of Americana and things you know I didn't know, right? It's sort of a little bit of those of you who watch Saturday Night Live, there used to be a thing with um Adam Sandler would go through about who all the Jews were, and a lot of you didn't know they were actually Jewish. Like, this Jewish Jew, and he's Jewish Jew, and you know, like like Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley's Jewish. Now, and he, he he wasn't an observant Jew, but his mother was Jewish, which under Jewish law would make him a Jew. And so it, I always wondered why Mark was so obsessed with Elvis. He in his in his house at the Hamptons, Mark has this full size statue of Elvis Presley <laughs> sitting there. He was always obsessed with Elvis. Well, well, Elvis is not only sort of the epitome of Americana in some regards, he's also a Jew. And so he goes through these different people uh, and, and things. And then of course, the, the, the interesting thing I think Mark talks about here, uh, tying Judaism to America, you know, he says, you know, the, the central American hero in some ways, and this is something my kids would appreciate is kal -El. Superman, who was the creation of two Jewish guys who made the Superman comic books, etc. So he pulls through all these sorts of things, which I think make it really sort of gripping, you know, for an American reader, a modern reader, whether you're you're Jewish or not. Um, now let's go through some of these principles because I, I you know, what what I found particularly interesting uh, interesting as a Christian is 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 really looking at the the principles he's drawing from from the Haggadah and the Passover Seder and Jewish teaching and how how central they are to us, because I think some of us have this tendency to say, oh, well, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament, the New Testament, everything changes. And even though Jesus said, I came, you know, to fulfill the law, right? But, but everything changes. And Apollo write about, we're no longer Jew and Gentile. We're no longer, you know, free and slave. We're all one people. All of which is true. The universality of, of the Christian faith is, 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 is a central tenet. But um, a lot of these tenets also are, are, are deeply derived from the rabbinic tradition and, and the Jewish tradition uh, as well. And so the greatest principle of the Torah, I mean, he's got this, uh, one of his early chapters as he's developing this explication, the greatest principle of the Torah, you know, and you are reading, oh, what is this? It's interesting. Love the stranger, right? Yeah, and yeah. so, um, you know, we every week here will say here are the two great commandments that, that, that Jesus explicated, love God and, 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 and love your neighbor, which of course are, are a distillation of the Ten Commandments into two, right? Mm -hmm. But, but um, love the stranger is mm -hmm. the, the greatest principle of the Torah that he talks about here. Mm -hmm. And so instantly those of us who you know, are, are steeped in New Testament are thinking about things like the parable of the Good Samaritan and, and loving the stranger and bringing different people together and this is, I think, it, it animates Mark's life. It's it's why he does these cross fate things. I mean, Mark uh, has 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 been very successful in business. He's a, he's a very very uh, generous and successful philanthropist, and he does some of these philanthropies in in Israel. He does others in other places. So so um, Mark and his wife, in combination with the Christian Broadcasting Network, mm -hmm. have set up a series of of, of ten. Uh, Christian hospitals in sub-Saharan Africa. So part of what Mark is doing is saying, you know, who needs healthcare the most? Um, I think, you know, where can I have the most impact? And so he's he's teamed with Christian partners to build hospitals and healthcare and put millions of dollars into this to build hospitals and healthcare facilities uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa to treat people. So this is how he lives his own life. And it's something that's deeply uh, embedded in him. And there, there's a quote here, and this is something that, you know, because because I think because Judaism is not generally a, a proselytizing faith the way Christianity is, and is not a, a, a universal faith in the same sense, um, it's, it's easy to think, oh, you know, this is an insular faith and we're the universal faith. But, 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 but reading this chapter really dispelled me of that notion, not to the extent I, I, I deeply held it before, but it really undercuts the notion. And, and there's a quote in there that Mark talks about good particulars to become good universalists. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, and, and, and so it, it doesn't mean, you know, I mean, Mark wouldn't, would not, you know, reject the principle that you would be choose a marital partner who's equally yoked or something like this, well, in Christian terms, equally yoked, uh, or that you would neglect your, your home community, your home synagogue, your home temple, or your home church. Um, but by strengthening those bonds, you become stronger universalists. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is something, you know, we were always sort of talking about these tensions. You know, Wendy, who's here, Wendy Muller uh, spoke last week, chaired our, our pastor nominating committee search. And you know, we were always sort of trying to digest what the church wanted. And there's always these sorts of tensions between an outward facing church and what you do for the community and sort of the inward facing church and what you do with worship and with your own and taking care of your own. And, 
And the way Mark navigates this in terms of loving the stranger being the great command, but that doesn't mean that you neglect the particular as the particular of your own community and how result how, how strengthening that particular bond in your own faith community empowers you to become a better universalist. I, you know, I just found very powerful. I, I highly recommend that section mm -hmm. of the book. Um, another one uh, titled The Great Jewish Permission again, just dovetailed so much uh, with, with the way we think uh, as Christians and really the, the Christian principles that are embedded in our own society. And, and you know, the, the great Jewish permission, as Mark describes it, is, you know, permission to begin again. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, he talks about that. And, and the, the, the Passover experience and particularly the Exodus experience is this rebirth mm -hmm. of the Jewish community that had been, you know, had gone, you know, uh, you know to a, a foreign land, had become enslaved and then mm -hmm. came back as a reborn community. And, and it, it, the, the concept of permission is, of course, and, and rebirth are just so central to, to various different Christian denominations. I mean, I mean, various evangelical traditions, you know, if you haven't had a born again experience, you're not a real Christian. You know, that's not traditionally the way we viewed it in mainland churches. But I mean, in the Catholic church, I mean, confessional is core. To the Catholic Church, confessing your sins and when, confessing your sins individually, and of course we confess our sins communally every week in our worship service. Service. So this notion of permission and and rebirth, and of course it's something that we see in our uh, you know our crucifixion story on mm -hmm. the cross, where Christ at the cross at at the last, you know, someone has a, another chance, right? And and this is something that's embedded, of course, in so much of our. You know, American society. It was embedded in Jewish society. I mean, those, those, you read the though it doesn't mean like every seven years you're 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 you know you're set free. Your debts are, are, are relinquished. I mean, this sort of principle animates the the culture that Jesus and and uh, his disciples grew up in, um, and and it's it's something that that we uh, in our society embed as well. Everything mm. from bankruptcy law, mm. you know, which is a fundamental tenet of our economic system, mm. divorce law. I mean, of course, mm. Jesus was was tougher on on sort of the abuse of divorce divorce law uh, in his time and the way this is being abused and of course holds a very high standard if you take what he says literally but but you know th this concept of rebirth and being able to have a second chance um even in our polity you know the second chance act for for prisoners something that that uh you know was passed just in the last few years so this is th th this notion of, of having second chances and the permission here i think very parallels what 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 we understand our, our Christian teaching, and it has deep roots here in this book and in the centrality of, of, of Jewish thought. Um, parts of the book go through things in the Passover service that if you if you've been to a seder, you know you'll know. Uh, you know, I mean, and, and if, if, I, if I had a critique, if I'd been sort of an editor for Mark, I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Wendy did this last week, so I guess it's part of what we do here. I mean, if I had a critique, the parts of the book, I think, will not be instantly accessible to people who don't know um, anything about Jewish Passover seders or don't know uh, anything about Jewish thinking and teaching. There's, there's a level of uh, assumption in some, in some of the chapters, not all of them, in some of the chapters where it sort of assumed you know this. Oh, the four questions, the four sons. These are parts of 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 the Haggadah, parts of what you'll do in every Passover Seder, but they're not in, in, intuitively known to those of us who are outside the tradition. I, you know, I, I, again, if you view it as a guidebook and not a work of fiction, you know, you're not reading, uh, you know, uh, your your latest novel off the shelf. You know, it, it's not as big of a problem really because you know. You just pick up your phone and Google, oh, what does this mean? And you can find the answers, which is what I did. If I, if I was encountering, I don't know exactly what he's talking about here. So I'll Google this and, and, and get a, 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 a little bit more background. But, but I do find it quite interesting because, you know, these questions, I mean, as you, as you experience a Seder, it is sort of for the children. And these seem sort of simple. You know, how is this night different from all other nights? You know, in other nights, we eat leavened foods and matzah. Why only, why only matzah on this night? Or mm -hmm. other nights, we eat all the vegetables. Why this night only the bitter herbs? Or mm -hmm. in other nights, we don't even dip once. Why do we dip twice on this night? On other nights, we eat sitting upright or reclining. I mean, these seem, why, this, why do we only recline on this night? So these weird sorts of questions mm -hmm. about the way the Passover is structured um, you know, seem a little simple, but Mark, Mark draws a heck of a lot more out of these than, than I could have certainly done at first blush. 
um, and goes through the different sons and they sort of talk about how you instruct your children depending on different personalities and styles like the wise son, the wicked son, the simple or lazy son, the son who doesn't know enough to ask. And you know, Mark has some counterintuitive readings of these sons and counterintuitive uh, readings of you know, what type of son he would want his daughters to marry uh, in there, uh, which, which were interesting and I thought thought provoking. Um, you know, he talks about, uh, as he's explicating different parts of the God, he talks about the religion of character um, and, and, and talks about uh, willpower and temporal discounting and temptation and, and how habits matter. Um, we will do and we will hear. And this is something that I think, you know, all of us embrace implicitly. Um, if we don't necessarily think about it so much. I mean, uh, our, our worship services is substantially redundant and repetitive, and we say the same sorts of things mm -hmm. basically every week. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of this is just sort of habit forming and habit building. Um, and and uh, you know, this, this ties into to lots of other sorts of things. I mean, sometimes you just, the, the, the notion like act as if um, you're doing something. Sometimes you, you, you act first and you're sort of, your, your, your heart may follow. Um, I mean, these are central for like addiction recovery and things like this, these sort of mantras. Um, and, 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 and he sort of talks about how this is to, to build up your character in religion and why these things sort of matter. And it, it, this is useful to me um, as someone who's sort of more on the intellectual side. There's a reason why I like the Presbyterian church. I'm more on the intellectual side of our faith. I sort of like analyzing this stuff. I like understanding things and sort of reaching the answers. And, you know, sort of so, so the, the repetitive, repetitive, repetitive nature of some of this stuff, like, oh, do we really need all this sort of, well, well Mark's argument is, yes, we absolutely do. We're, we're, we're failed human beings. And these are the sorts of things um, that build us up. Um, you, I think one of the more powerful parts here uh, of the book, which was really interesting to me, um, was his chapter on, on suffering. Mm. Um, and, you know, to me, this is always sort of the central uh, challenge for theism, mm -hmm. at period, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 you know, why do we have suffering in the world? I mean, this is, this is the sort of thing theologians and scholars and philosophers have been wrestling with forever. If we have a, 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 an omniscient and omnipotent God who's beneficent, why is there suffering in the world? Mm -hmm. And this suffering isn't always suffering of, of mankind's evil. Sometimes it's just natural disaster. Mm -hmm. Those of us in New Bern are very well aware of this. Mm -hmm. You know, we were hit by a horrible hurricane that flooded many of our homes, um, you know, not so long ago, not long after I moved here. You know, why does this happen? And, you know, Mark directly wrestles with this. Um, you know, and he's saying, why 200 years of slavery in Egypt for the Jews? Why 250 years of slavery in the United States for the, the African, the formerly African slaves? You know, he, he wrestles with these questions. And, and, you know, these are the sorts of things, you know, we sort of look at the book of Job, which is, of course, a common common book for, for Jews and Christians alike, um, and, and, and try to wrestle these things. There aren't necessarily easy answers, but Mark, I think, is just incredibly thoughtful on this, and he talks about two different concepts in the Hebrew on this, hmm. Lama and Madua, and they're, they're two different um, words uh, for trying to understand something uh, that, I, that I think really sort of help us uh, get at this. And, and, you know, one of them is a more clinical understanding and one of them is sort of like a deeper rooted understanding. And he talks about these different, how these different Hebrew words have different meanings and connotations. And sometimes if we try to, to shoehorn uh, a, a llama question, you know, a more sort of clinical, rational, you know, why does this book make a sound when we drop it sure. answer, as opposed to a Magia, Magia answer, it, it, it looks horrific. But the Magua is something, it's sort of this mystery, it's, it's harder to understand. Mm -hmm. And he talks a lot in there, and this is something those of us who are trying to counsel other people going through difficulty, through grief, through hardship, you know, talks about sometimes just the value of silence and grieving. In other words, mm -hmm. this is something, and I said this in our, in our, in our book talk in the spring, this is something I struggle with, right? I, I'm sort of an analytical person, and I was a management consultant, I'm a pol policy think tank person, I, I try to come up with answers. Well, this isn't always a great thing to be as a husband or a father, right? Because, because you know, my wife will come up to me, oh, this look what happened to me at work today. My instant reaction is always to try to, oh, well, here's what you need to do. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you do this, and or, or this is what this person means by that. No, no, this, this really always fails. Right? Always. 
sometimes he's like, yeah, sometimes I just want you to listen. I was like, okay, this is hard for me. But Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark is really good on this in this book and, and how grieving, you know, there's not a, it's not like he has an answer for why there were the, the Jews were enslaved for so long, or why the, the, the Africans were enslaved for so long, or, or why, you know, hurricanes, right? There's not necessarily an easy answer to it. But I think just a, the, the, the way, the refractory way he thinks about it and asks us to, to consider it, I think is extremely useful. You know, there, there's uh, you know, an interesting um, sort of chapter on prayer. Um, and he and Winnie had an interesting back and forth on this on our, our, our book call in the spring, but, you know, he, he he talks about the difference between the English pray and the Hebrew equivalent tefillah. Um, the English pray is a reflexive verb. Mm. The Hebrew equivalent is a non-reflexive verb. And what this means about how we think about praying mm. um, and, you know, asking for help isn't exactly enough. He talks about, you know, communal prayers, we prayers, um, all sorts of things that we, again, as Christians do. And I think he shines incredible light on it. Um, you know, on, on the, the chapter on, on political arguments, I think, you know, I found, you know, again, this is sort of what I do for a living, not politics per se, which I find kind of repellent, but, um, but policy, I mean, this is what I do. I'm trying to persuade people. Um, and, you know, he just said most of them are, are just folly, right? And, and uh, you're not going to do it. And what's interesting in here to me, and, you know, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, you know, thought about this a long time, you know, you know, I, and I, I sort of experiment with this. I mean, I, most of most political discussions, like on Twitter, but sometimes you have Facebook, these social media things. And, and you know, I, I, I sort of experimented, okay, well, if I frame this link to something with a, you know, very erudite or, 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 or carefully constructed lead in, you know, often it'll just die in the, mm. die in the, in the ethosphere. And if I put something provocative, um, maybe a little offensive, it takes off, right? I mean, this happens, and this is what happens very much in, in our, our polity today. Um, and the various reasons, you know, why have our politics become this way? I mean, I, I, and listen, I, I, I'm in mean, no illusions that we always, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, especially those of us uh, who grew up in the South, although I, like Mark, I mean, I grew up, I grew up on the day George Wallace was shot in 1972. So I grew up after a lot of this sort of stuff, after the 60s, um, and, and in a different era, uh, but, but you know, you don't have to look very far back in our history to see um, very ugly moments. So it's not as if, you know, democratic politics has ever been, uh, you know, a, a clean, nice, pleasant thing. Um, I mean, listen, Richard Dobbs Sprague was, was, was shot in a duel here uh, by, by, by Congressman John Stanley two years before Burr shot Hamilton, you know, when everyone knows that story, uh, if they didn't know it before, they know it now with a, with a hit musical on it. So, so it's not as if, it's not as if we've always had, you know, just sort of this, this, this easy to get along. And Mark sort of goes at some of the fundamental wisdom and reasons why I think in here. Um, I mean, I think it's sort of a, it's a very short chapter. It's an interesting adjunct to Jonathan Haidt's, uh, book, The Righteous Mind, which maybe I should write around in here sometime. We had him as our Rissen lecturer in Manhattan a few years back, uh, why good people uh, disagree about politics and religions. It sort of goes through some of the psychological evolutionary underpinnings of that, et cetera. Um, but Mark in here sort of goes through some of the social science. I mean, he goes through the exodus and goes through you know the plagues and sort of saying like, you know, how could Pharaoh not learn, right? I mean, you had all these plagues and then he still sends his chariots out. I mean, all the firstborn sons get killed and he still won't stop. Like, why do people not learn? And, and, and Mark, you know, Mark does this and he, and he, he talks about uh, a 2004 experiment uh, done at Emory um, by uh, where the professor put together supporters of Bush and supporters of Kerry and, and put in functional magnetic resonance imaging machines on their brains to sort of monitor what was going on in their brains. And they were presenting, looking at the reactions when the candidates contradicted themselves. And what they found was the prefrontal cortex, you know, our, our reasoning centers weren't aroused at all. What was arousing these folks were the, the orbital frontal cortex processing emotions, the anterior cingulate cortex conflicts, the posterior cingulate cortex associated with addiction. Hmm. And um, when the subjects came to a conclusion, their ventral striatum was just aroused, which is the part of the brain affiliated with orgasm. So, so you know, these sorts of emotional, and it's, it, it, it's, it, it's true. And it's something that, you know, I always have to think about, you know, uh, yeah. 
I had this faith, perhaps naive, that if you can really sort of explicate the ideas correctly, that in the long run, people will read this and in the long run, people will listen. And I, I do think there's a truth to that. I wouldn't be doing what I do if I didn't believe it. But, but certainly in the short run, you know, that's not what we experience. And these emotional uh, experiences are front and center when we get in these sort of uh, uh, disagreements. And I think it's something for us, um, it's again, something we were talking about in the pastor nominating committee. We have a diverse um, um, congregation in terms of belief structures, in terms of politics, in terms of theology. And, you know, how do we bring these people together and get along? I think it's a very important thing um, for us to, to think about and understand. And uh, Mark, Mark sort of concludes this chapter, the education that God and the rest of us with him receives with the failure of the plagues is one for the ages. Mm. It is especially ripe to guide in this era when technology has made attempts at public persuasion so easy to mount. Mm. Successful persuasion does not come from sermons, lectures, arguments, singular acts, data claims, or any other, any other short-term demonstration, it almost always comes as a result of long-term commitment, of genuine compassion, actual suffering with, mm. of demonstrated respect, and acts of love. It is living far more than telling. It is admiration far more than instruction. So, I mean, you can just see, I mean, first of all, you can see that this is a way well-written book, um, and that I think it's just full of um, um, just wisdom for all of us um, in, in, in our sort of uh, daily lives. I think it will, will really help reorient most of us as Christians who, um, even if we have studied the Old Testament a lot, even if we have had a lot of Jewish friends, even if we have been to seders and, and Shabbat dinners, you know, the level of depth here is just far beyond what most of us have ever encountered. And I think the, the sort of drawing together of our American experiences, our modern experiences, social science, and, and, and just sort of the deep received wisdom of these texts uh, is, 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 is incredibly useful. And, and, and you, you'll just learn a lot about the Passover Seder as well. And I, I, I hope it's something that you know, our church can do. I realize the temple here is very small. It's not New York. We don't have a, a, a mm. massive Jewish population here, but, but, I, but I hope it's something we can do, continue to do. And I know we've done some historically uh, outreach uh, in this way. So yeah, I've got a, a, about 10 minutes left, eight, nine minutes left. So I've got hands up, Stacy Griffin. Uh, just one, one little piece to throw out there. We get invited almost every high holy holiday. Uh, anyone from our congregation that wants to participate next door in the temple. Um, they're always happy to have uh, folks in general from outside their community, but most particularly our community here, because we're. I have no idea. Oh yes, no always, idea. always. So if those at home couldn't hear, Stacy, we we are regularly invited to their high holy days. Uh, and, next door. Uh, next door to the temple. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean we were right next door to the Jewish temple in town, which is pretty neat, I think. So. Okay, so make sure you talk if you want. To, they need to be able to hear you. So you got to talk. You got to talk oh, the louder. Jewish temple in the state. In North Carolina? Yeah. Yeah. Um, good. Okay. So I would say if you're on the periphery, you either have to like come to the table or you have to speak more, more loudly. For Any here. questions from folks online? I hope I've done a good job of, of summarizing some of the themes of this book. I mean, really, I've, I've only touched on what I found, you know, just to be real highlights of the book. Um, but, but there are so many. And like I said, there's 60 chapters. Some of the earlier ones are longer. They're more like the developing of the framework, et cetera. And then the later ones are just like taking a little piece, a little nugget and, and, you know, are very quick reads, but, but, you know, he could obviously have expanded this. It's not a super long book. I think the, the actual text is you know, just under 300 pages, but he could have easily expanded it to 800, but then it would become, you know, as I know, having done my own book, you know, they don't want you to have your book to be too long. Certainly That's not, true. you know, because then no one reads it. Away. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to learn how to be concise and, and redact your arguments down to sort of their core sometimes. Was that any, anybody from the, the Zoom is here? Oh, Janet, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I, hi. I just wondered, have you ever been to a Messianic um, Seder, a Messianic Jewish Seder? I have not. It's, I it's have not. Very it blends Christianity and Judaism together in a, uh, a very interesting way because uh, it uses the New Testament and the Old Testament together. It's a little longer than a straightforward Jewish Seder, but um, the church might be open to doing some something like that that combines 
uh, they have passages from Luke and everything else included, which it sounds like your author has done some of that. I just wondered if it, if you haven't been to one, but it, it, has anybody here been to one? It's kind of interesting, it's very different, and a lot of the background, of course, will be the same. Yeah, yeah, I have not, and and knowing Mark as well as I do, I, I'm 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 confident he he wouldn't view that as as the right way to do um, a Jewish seder. But 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 you know that, that's okay. I mean, I think it's interesting for us intellectually to do it. Um, and you know, I, I certainly have come across Messianic Jews. I mean, that's when you when you live in New York and you go to universities in the Northeast, you come across a lot of Orthodox Messianic Jews. You know, the, the Orthodox ones are always like, "Oh, are you Jewish? Are you Jewish?" And then they're going to try to talk to you if you are. But um, you know, so, so you, you run into folks a lot more than you would here in the South, or certainly in Eastern North Carolina part of the I South. I think the closest Messianic congregation is Wilmington, actually. Okay. Um, I say any any other questions from the. I thought from, I saw another hand. From Zoom land, you got to you're going to have to unmute yourself. I was muting folks to keep the sound down. Um, any other questions? Okay. Any questions from the the outer rim here in the classroom? <laughs> Otherwise, I bet Jim probably has five more minutes to. He could probably fill five more minutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly could. I've sort of been through the parts <laughs> I wanted all to the prepare. Parts <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to leave a little time in case people sure. had some questions. I mean, well, one part, one thing I skipped over here in my outline that, that I think is is interesting. I mean, he sort of of, of talks uh, in terms of how we interpret things, et cetera. And he's got this section on what he calls feeling God's pleasure, uh, which is sort of saying versus telling. Um, and, you know, useful, I think, I mean, it's in the context of how you do this in a Seder, but I think it's, 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 it's a, a broader um, thought process that goes, that goes in here. Like there's a difference between saying and telling and um, it, it goes through these sort of questions from the sons in the Passover Seder. Uh, he said, the question of the wise son is from Exodus 13, 8, and you shall tell your child. Mm. The question of the wicked son is from Exodus 12, 26, and when your children say to you. Um, and so it, it, it's an interesting, interesting thing. He says, he says telling is integral to everything Jewish, but it's a little different than saying. So, so I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting sort of explication there that, that I, I found uh, just an interesting way to think about things a little different. Saying kind of um, is, is more of a one-sided conversation. Yes. You say something and there's not a big response, you know, expected. But if you tell something, there's a way in which it invites you know, dialogue or conversation or, you know, reaction. That's Can y'all hear her? I'm just, curious. I'm just curious. I'm testing the limits. Oh, very good. All Excellent. right, cool. So That's does telling imply also or a but teaching in the thought process? Saying, telling. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a different level. It's a different level of engagement. And, you know, I, I do think those of us in our sort of Post Enlightenment rationalist world often will read these old scriptural texts through that lens, and I think that they're at their fundamental. And this is something Eddie always stressed in our Kerygma class. You know, uh, they, they were written in a different time with a sort of different style um, and and a, a different level of engagement. I mean, he talks. He's got this this interesting part of the book. Uh, you know, why Jewish boys emerge from the womb uncircumcised, and he talks about the the sort of back and forth, um, the, the notion of, 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 of our religious practice being a, a back and forth with God, a relationship mm. with God, mm. a commitment with God. And he talks about how in the wilderness, um, you know, people, the, 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 the people in the wilderness were craving something more than manna. I mean, manna was supposed to be the perfect food, but they didn't have to do anything for it. Whereas mm. before they were cultivating their food and this sort of level of energy and work and and to me, it sort of reminded me, you know, Arthur Brooks um, wrote, wrote these books about sort of like earned success and how right. people, you know, people have to sort of actually do something to, to feel ownership of it and to really feel successful. It's why a lot of people, if, you know, you just inherit a lot of money and don't do anything, you know, that, that, that's not the key to happiness, whereas right. earned success can lead towards people's happiness. Right. And so this sort of back and forth um is is interesting he says you know rav kahana the ancient sage of the talmud observed that a person prefers a kav a measure of grain of his own produce 
to nine kav of another person's. Mm. And this view was confirmed by his contemporary. And he said, in the 21st century, social scientists have identified this as the Ikea effect, <laughs> where the more people put into some pursuit, the more they come to value it. So in Ikea, you sort of have to put together your own furniture. Right. If you have to put your, you know, it, it, it put your own toil into to your work on something, you value it more. And so, you know, this is sort of, this is all driven from like, you know, why did Jewish, you know, why, why, why force people to do this to their kids? Why not have them come out this way? And so this is the Talmudic wisdom, but it also draws into these much broader uh, thoughts about, you know, how we engage and how we have to struggle with this. Um, and so, and I guess I'll, I'm now coming to the very end. You are so at the very end. So to lead with this, um, you know, the Jewish prayer of healing from Psalm 121.2, I'll conclude with this, has a built-in commentary. The Psalm is, my help is from with the Lord. That's the literal translation, mm -hmm. not from the Lord, not with the Lord, but from with the Lord. And so he, that weird construction is sort of the way he thinks about how we engage with God. Um, it's from God, it's with God, and it's that interactive relationship with God, that active relationship with God uh, that requires effort on our part that is so fulfilling. And, and so, you know, you know, this is in the middle of the book. There's lots, there's, there's so much in the book. You know, you, 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 could, you could spend an entire class on like each chapter of this book because I think that the, even the short one, there's so much there you could talk about. But, but uh, I highly encourage it, you know, not just uh, because he's my friend, you know, um, <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it, it, is, it is, I think, a special book. And I think uh, one I would urge people to, yeah. to take a look at. So. Thank and you. I will I will donate one to the library. So yes, that's what I say. It's, I was going to say I was going to lead in. Janet is on, and Janet is our next presenter. So I didn't know if, Janet if you wanted to give like a little a little teaser at all. Oh, she's right. Wait, wait, wait. You're muted. So <laughs> make sure you make sure you unmute. Janet, unmute. Janet, unmute. Unmute, unmute, Janet. Got it. Okay. Um, this, is, yeah. this has been cropping up a lot lately, and it's called "Why Social Justice Is Not Biblical Justice." And we're beginning to see a lot of answers in the newspapers and questions are asked. I'm talking about language here and how it's used, uh, the understanding of each of the words. I'm, I'm gonna be talking about our history. Um, I'll go back to the Magna Carta if I have to, <laughs> because uh, uh, a lot of common law uh, came out of that. And then it was incorporated into the US constitution, some of it, it was, changed of course but um this is what it's it's very very controversial book I, there's no way there's nothing bland about this but um it's worth reading it's worth understanding i think where we are today um in 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 the united states and not and beyond in in the western in western civilization and it's a christian view um so Please join me, and I, ha, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to enjoy talking to you about it. It's fascinating. So we'll look at language and a whole bunch of things. I hope you understand Either. some things. Thank you. I, I've already put that in my Kindle too. Oh yes, <laughs> I'm a public. <laughs> Very particularly <laughs> interesting to me. So <laughs> good, good. Okay, wonderful. Well, we'll see. We'll see y'all next time. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank you.